Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Professor Leach again. Today we're going to talk about some antiderivative problems. I'm going to start with this one. This is problem three on chapter six, section two. And it said it we're told that the area between the graph of y equals x squared minus c squared and the x-axis is 972, and we're asked to find the exact value of c. It works out to an integer, so I don't know why they have to be like, I'll find the exact value, but that's okay. Uh, we also do want the positive value of C. So here's what we know. So the graph of X squared minus C squared is gonna be a parabola and it's gonna have X intercepts at C and negative C because that's what's gonna make this equal to zero. And we'll have a Y intercept that I forgot to draw down here at zero and negative C squared. We're told that the area is 972. What that means in terms of the definite integral is that if we integrate, if we integrate from negative c to c, the function x squared minus c squared to x, we'll get a value of 972. But this integral is not going to equal 972. What will the definite integral give us? If I integrate this function, looking at the, what the function looks like between negative c and c, if I integrate the function between negative c and c, I'm not going to get 972. Since the function is below the x axis, we're going to get a negative 972. That's not going to matter until we actually go to solve the equation that ends up being the equation in C. But it's going to be important that the area is negative because the definite integral will read uh, a function below the x-axis as negative. So this is because the area is below the x-axis. Area below the x-axis. So the area is below the x-axis, so that's why it's going to be negative. This is the setup for the problem. What we have to do now is figure out the value of c that we're looking for. And to that end, we just need to use the fundamental theorem of calculus on definite integral parts. So we're going to use the fundamental theorem over here. So the integral of x squared minus c squared with respect to x, this is an important thing to notice. c is not the variable, c is a constant, x is the variable. So the integral of x squared is 1 3rd x cubed. But c squared is a constant. So I'm not gonna add one to the exponent and divide by the exponent on c. I'm gonna read this as minus c squared as a constant. So the antiderivative is minus c squared times x. Just as if that x squared minus c squared was x squared minus five, the antiderivative will be one third x cubed minus five x. Then we're gonna evaluate this from x equals negative c to x equals c. So this is our notation for plugging in the endpoints and then subtracting. This is still going to end up being ni negative 972. So that's the first part, recognizing that the area will be given by a definite integral. Second part of that is noticing that the area is below the x-axis, so the integral will call it negative area. Then we move on to solving, which is use the fundamental theorem of calculus by finding an antiderivative at which point people are going, you should be going, oh yeah, that's the theme of this section. Now we just have to do some algebra to solve the equation. So I'm gonna plug in a C, I'm gonna need more space on the carriage return down here. I'm gonna plug in the C, it's gonna get cubed, minus C squared times X. And then we're gonna plug in a negative C. So I'm gonna plug in x equals c. c cubed minus c squared times c. Then I'm also gonna plug in a negative c. So plug in negative c. So 
So plug in the endpoints and subtract capital F at B minus capital F at A. This is all sitting inside of an equation, so I'm not gonna put an equal sign after the 972. That's a really bad habit. Even though these things are all equal, I'm just gonna write, rewrite the equation with the C's plugged in. Now I'm gonna simplify. I get a third C cubed minus a C cubed. Gonna have lots of C cubes here, looks like. And then we're gonna have, um, it's far too early for me to start. Minus C cubed is a minus, uh, minus C, sorry, the cube of the opposite of C is the opposite of the cube of C. So I'll have a minus one third C cubed here. And C squared times C is gonna be a plus C cubed here. This is all still equal to negative 972. Going slowly through the steps because it's early and algebra is tricky. So what we have is just a bunch of C cubed running around. So let's see, I have a third C cubed minus C cubed, minus and minus is a plus a third C cubed minus and plus is minus C cubed. So now we can see that we have all like terms. So I have two thirds minus uh, two. So I have positive two thirds C cubed minus two C cubed. So minus two plus two thirds is negative one and a third. Watch out, I'm doing arithmetic. Oh, dang it, negative 972. So then we'll just multiply by 3 fourths, a negative 3 fourths, and then take the cube root. I'm not even going to try that. 972 um, times 3 divided by 4. 729. They were all exact value and it came out to an integer, so I don't know what they're worried about. They should have known that going in. That's how they built the problem. So what I wanted to emphasize here is that there's a lot, uh, once the problem gets to here, we're just playing algebra. It's just the algebra game from here on out. The calculus portion all takes place in this upper section. So the upper section is the calculus part that we should be more concerned about. This part is just the algebra part, which we may or may not be good at, which just comes with practice and experience and some training. Any questions? So the things that we're going to look for when we're doing these problems Always think about what you know. What can you do to, to solve a problem? The big cue here was you're given an area. Once the area, the word area shows up, you should start thinking, oh, oh, it's going to be some, some definite integral stuff. That 972 is going to be some definite integral. Then when you start to draw a picture to get the details, you're like, ah, negative area. I see your game, you rogue. And then you know that definite integral has the antiderivative business. And once they use the word exact value, you're like, ah, I'm not gonna be able to use my calculator to find the exact values, even though we could have in this case. I'm not gonna be able to use my calculator to find the exact values. I'm going to have to use my algebra skills, my mad algebra skills. Okay, I'm sorry. I, how did you get the 729? What am I missing? Uh, I'm, I took the, the negative 972 and divided by the four thirds. So I just need, I needed to isolate the C cubed. So I did negative 972 
972, and I divide it by a negative four thirds. So I actually, I actually multiplied it by three fourths and I dropped the negatives. And the, the one, all the C values, C cubed values were combined. So it was two Yeah, these are all three. now like terms because they're all C cubes. Okay. So I have negative two plus a third plus another third. So negative six thirds plus two thirds is negative four thirds. Got it. Yeah, I was trying to do that. And for some reason I was getting the wrong answer. So I'm like, why the, where the hell did that come from? All right. Right before this class started, I was adding all these things up and I was getting two thirds. So that that's, we're going to have issues down here because this is not our focus. <laughs> the important part is saying area, definite integral, antiderivative. But then, and then it's like all algebra. Oh man. So yeah, I did this problem before this one right here in class, I did this problem two times and I kept coming up with two thirds here because arithmetic. So full disclosure, I should have recorded that. And it was kind of embarrassing because I'm like all negative one and negative one cancel out obviously. We have a similar question in six to four. Different function. We want to consider the area between the curve y equals e to the x minus 10 and the x axis between 0 and c for c greater than 0. Find the value of c that makes the area above the axis equal to the area below the x axis. So this is a similar kind of problem. Our function is an e to the x minus 10. So against my own advice, I'm going to draw it although I only need positive x-axis. So we've got, um, we're gonna have a uh, horizontal asymptote at negative 10. And I have a horizontal asymptote at negative 10. And we're gonna draw, I'm just gonna draw an exponential function. probably going to be more radical than this, but there's the, the function y equals e to the x minus 10. And we're integrating c. The, we're integrating from 0 to c. So we have a question about area between 0 and x equals c. So we need to, to know some things. Uh, we need to know where this happens. That's going to be of interest to us. But then we're integrating up to some point c. And we want to figure out the value of C such that the area below the x-axis is equal to the area above the x-axis. So the setup is that these two areas are equal. So these areas are equal. Area means we're going to do some kind of definite integral business. And it looks like we're going to integrate from 0 to this point and come up with a negative area and integrate from this point in the middle to C. And those two areas are going to be the same. So that's how we're going to figure out the value of C. And this down here is asymptote where y is equal to 10, negative 10. All right, so let's figure out the green area first, or let's figure out where this point is. We need to know where this graph crosses the y-axis. So the first order of business is where does e to the x minus 10 cross the x-axis?
because that's where it'll cross the, y, the x axis. So e to the x equals, this tells us that e to the x equals 10. And so that happens when x equals the natural log of 10. So now we know where that point is. Now that we have where that point is, now that we know that this crosses at natural log of 10, we can find the green area. So if we integrate from zero to our newly found natural log of 10, the function e to the x minus 10 to x, that'll give us the area below. It's gonna come out negative. And so I'll change the sign and I'll just set up an equation with this area up here. So let's, let's find this out. We need to find the antiderivative. This is equal to the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. And then the antiderivative of 10 is 10x evaluated from zero to natural log of 10. So we plug in the endpoints and we have e to the natural log of 10 minus 10 times the natural log of 10 minus some black, bad planning. e to the zero minus 10 times zero. Plug in the endpoints and subtract. Capital F at B minus capital F at A. So here's natural log of 10 plugged in and here's the zero plugged in. E to the natural log of 10 is, let's see, I don't have to switch pages anyway, so e to the natural log of 10 is just a 10 minus 10 natural log of 10. I'm going to leave it that way for now. E to the minus e to the zero, which is one, and 10 times zero is zero. So we end up with nine minus natural log of nine minus 10 natural logs of 10. That's the area below the x axis. Any questions so far? So what I want, that's the green area. Let's, let's approximate what this is so that we have some kind of context because most humans are not familiar with this strange number system or they don't recognize this number immediately. So negative 14.02. So what I want is I want to integrate from natural log of 10 to C and come up with negative 14.026. Any questions? And then we'll just figure out what C is similar to the way we did in problem three. So let's, oh, dang it. Oh, see, now it's all, I think I did this exact same thing yesterday. What's crazy is I normally don't do these things. There we go. All right, so, um, now we're gonna look at the area above. So the area above The area above the x-axis goes from natural log of 10 up to c. It's the same function, e to the x minus 10 to x. And I want this area to equal the area below. But I have to change the sign. I want this to equal positive 14.026. Or we can write that as 10 natural log of 10 minus nine. 
So if you want to change the sign of a subtraction problem, just switch the order. So here's the exact thing I want it to equal. Here's the approximation that I want it to equal. I'm going to keep that 14.026 stored in my calculator in case I need to divide by it or something or set up an equation or something like that. So, and since I'm going to be solving an equation for C and it's a mixture of exponential and polynomial function, I'm going to have to use a machine to solve that equation. But let's do the work. Now I'm going to find the antiderivative of e to the x minus 10 again. So that's going to be an e to the x minus 10x evaluated this time from the natural log of 10 up to C. So e to the x, I'm going to plug in the endpoints. So e to the C minus 10C minus e to the natural log of 10 minus 10 natural log of 10. There I am plugging in my lower bound. Natural log of 10 is my lower bound this time and C is my upper bound. Oops, I did two. So E to the C minus 10 C, uh, I'm gonna set this equal to 10 natural log of 10 minus nine. And so we could see, we could probably get, a, get rid of a little bit of stuff to make our lives easier. So this expression is going to be e to the c minus 10c minus e to the natural log of 10, which is 10. Minus and minus is plus 10 natural log of 10. And I want to set this equal to my 14.026, which is also 10 natural log of 10 minus nine. So let me get rid of this 10 natural log of 10 business. And I can put the 10 on the other side. And so what I want, let's see, let's, let's get rid of this. This is why we keep exact values around. And then I'll add 10 to both sides. And so the equation I'll end up with is e to the c minus 10c, add 10 to both sides, and what is equal to 1. Unfortunately, we're going to need a machine to solve this. So if we switch to the old Desmos and look at the function, ah, I didn't type it in. It's not going to display everything. So we could use a graphing calculator to solve this, but from a graphing standpoint, this is not a very good graphing calculator. It's a very good scientific calculator, but the graphing calculator on Desmos is much better at graphing. And that's what I want to use to solve. So um, the values that I get from Desmos are zero. That makes sense e to the zero minus zero. So this gives us two solutions. C equals zero, which is not what we want. We knew that one already. And we also get C equals 3.615, which is the one that we want. So on Desmos, you just plugged in e to the C minus 10C. Yeah, uh, I actually used uh, X, but yes. What about the one? You, you didn't input that? Uh, I graphed that as a separate equation. Got it. And then I looked for the intersection of those two points. Okay, got it. So let's see, it should be on the desk, desktop.
That is correct. The 14.026, I don't want the, that's the part that's below. That's the area below. I want that same area, but above the x-axis. And so that's why I want it to be positive. From the natural log of 10 to C, I have positive area. So uh, for those of you out in YouTube land watching this later, uh, I saw the equation on desmos.com. So uh, y'all can't see the screenshot, but if you just graph y equals e to the x minus 10x and also y equals one, and then look for the intersection. Look for the intersections of the graphs of those two functions. Uh, I have a question. Yes. How do you know that C equals zero? Is that just given to us? Uh, no, I got each of these values based on the intersection. So if you look at the graph, um, if you look at the graph that I just sent, that has two intersections, one of which we already knew at zero one, that's one of the intersections. And oh, okay. The other intersection was 3.615. That's the one that we wanted. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions? So notice what these problems had in common. It was about recognizing that definite integrals tell us area and then just breaking things apart to find out uh, and also recognizing that area below the x-axis is going to be negative and area above the x-axis is gonna be positive. On the other, the next problem on the homework is very similar. It's a question about average value. So let's at least set that one up. So chapter six, section two, problem five. It says find the average value of six over X squared on the interval one to C is equal to one. So this problem also involves a definite integral in that we have, look at the, we're looking for the average value. Uh, we want the average value of six over X squared to be on this interval from one to C to be equal to what? So the average value of six over X squared on the interval from one to C we're going to integrate from one to C the function six over X squared to X to make an average value. This is us adding up values of the functions to make an average value. We divide by one over C minus one. So if we just look up the formula for the average value. So that's just using the formula for the average value of a function on an interval. The important thing to note about this average value function, it's not important to memorize it. It's important to understand what this represents is we're adding up all the values of the function and dividing by how many there are there. This is what it looks like when instead of a discrete sum, you have a continuous sum. So you add up all the values of the function continuously over the interval and then just divide by the length of the interval. This is in fact an equation that we're trying to solve. So is one, we're saying this is equal to one and then we just wanna solve this equation for C. So we're given that the average value of six over X squared on the interval from one to C is equal to one. So we write down an expression for the average value of six over X squared on the interval from one to C and set it equal to one. Now we need to solve for C and that means finding an antiderivative of the function, plugging in the endpoints, 
and then we'll have an equation in C. So give that one a try and we'll go over the rest of, uh, if there are any questions, uh, further questions on this problem, we can look at that problem tomorrow. Any questions before we adjourn for the day? So antiderivative, endpoints, divide by C minus one, solve equation. On a related note, we did this same thing, this average value question in the previous problem. We want the area below and the area above to be the same. So we said, find the value of C for which the average value of e to the x minus 10 on the interval from zero to C is equal to zero. So the previous one was also an average value question. Any other questions, comments? Snide remarks? Yeah, the book sucks at trying to explain that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's because the book is static and it can't respond to, it can't read its audience and respond to what their questions are. It can only have programmed responses. And that's, that's the difficulty of learning math from a book. Is it just me or in the text? Is there like, when you click solve, does do some of the uh, questions not have answers to them or are they all can jumbled somewhere? Some of else? them don't. Okay. Uh, some of them don't. Some of them don't have solutions that they can just express easily. Got so it. I'm not okay. sure. I'm not sure why that is. Sometimes it's just they, I think sometimes for the solution, they're like, oh, we don't know what to write. So they just kind of bail. Okay. So uh, that, that's my theory anyway. Gotcha. I thought I was going crazy. Nope. It's always, it's always the problem that you, you need to look at and they don't have the solution for it. So. Yes. Those are the only ones that, and also it's, it's amplified by the fact that those are the ones that you're going to notice. Yeah. They're the one, there are problems that you did no, and you didn't have questions on. And if you look at the solutions for those, those might not be there, but you're going to notice on the ones that you're like, oh, I didn't get this one. I need a solution. And you yeah. look at the solution, the book's like, oh, nah. <laughs> so you notice, so there, there's a, a bit of a bias. Um, I can't remember what kind of bias this is, but uh, there's, a, there's a bias because you're only looking at those. Yeah. So, but it's very bad timing. And so it amplifies the fact that how we notice it. We notice yeah. it extra because it's like, oh no, this is a big deal now. I didn't care they didn't have the solution to the problem that I knew how to do. But right. now that they don't have this one, damn you, Wiley. <laughs> but, I mean, Pretty much. Hopefully, that's, that's, that's supposedly what you have me for. So hopefully yeah, I can cover those gaps. Cool. Any well, thanks questions? professor. All right. Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good day. Take care.